Well, basically, the whole problem is that the great reset that people are talking about uh, from Schwab, etc., you have to understand what that really was about. And <clears throat> Keynesian economics has been collapsing. Uh, for example, uh, the idea that you can raise interest rates to stop uh, inflation, etc., all that's pretty much out the window. Uh, when it was formed back in the 1930s, the government wasn't that significant. So, And it was a speculative boom, so they basically thought, okay, fine, raising interest rates, people won't be able to leverage and buy things. And that, you know, okay, that made sense back then. But today, government is the biggest borrower in, in the room. And if you raise interest rates... Uh, and they assume it's speculation like, like the 1920s, uh, what happens is the government ends up, you know, spending even more. Uh, politicians don't say, oh, gee, the Fed is raising interest rates. They want us to spend less. I mean, that never happens. Um, and the, this round of inflation that our computer's been projecting, uh, I mean, it forecast this out, you know, more than 10 years in advance and said that, you know, starting from 2020 on would be a commodity cycle, but based upon shortages, not speculation. And, I mean, what set that in motion was the, you know, the lockdowns and and things of this nature with COVID. Um, honestly, I mean, I don't know if these people have any clue as to how the world economy works. I mean, it's been, you know, pretty much standard that even New York City has less than, you know, 10 days worth of a food supply. So how do you stop all the trucks from going in, lock everybody down? I mean, this gets to be crazy. So you, you've you got, you know, ships lined up out there in California. I mean, you you can't shut down the supply chain, and that has caused you know, the initial surge. And they they also don't understand inflation. Um, and the inflation that went into the 1980s, you had people back then hoarding toilet paper and things. And uh, even now, when I go to the store, I mean, some things are, are gone. And then next week, they're back and something else is gone. So what do you do? You buy extra. Okay, so you start hoarding because you might not see it again for a few weeks. Um, so this type of inflation is based upon shortages, not speculation in, in the commodity markets and, and booms and busts and things of this nature. So raising in interest rates at this time is only going to make it worse. It's not going to make it better. Uh, and... You know, this fiction that, oh, the stock market's up only because interest rates are cheap, and that's also nonsense as well. I mean, if you just look at it from a capital flow perspective, um, you know, you see that the capital has been coming here. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese have been buying all sorts of properties and things of this nature, and the same thing in, in Europe. I mean, uh, the collectible markets are, are going red hot. Uh, the Chinese have been buying up, you know, rare coins, art, all sorts of different things. So you, you have to understand that, you know, it's United States, you get all these people always bashing the U.S., oh, the dollar is going to crash, blah, 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 and all the rest of this stuff. They never look outside the country. Yes, you know, we have, uh, okay, fine, deficits and a big debt. We also have the biggest economy. All right, and things are far worse in Europe um, than they are here. Japan, you know, is is also another you know serious problem as well. But Europe went negative on interest rates in 2014. They have not been able to stimulate their economy, which is proof that you know Keynesian economics has completely failed, um, and they don't consider how the economy functions. People were told to save money, and when you retire, you'll be able to live off the interest. Well, not when it's negative. 
Um, they've wiped out the pension funds um, <clears throat> in Europe because what happens is that the uh, pension funds are in Europe are by law have to have government debt. Generally, it depends what country you're looking at, anywhere from 70 to 90%. Um, in the U.S., Social Security, 100% is in government debt. So now if you take the government interest rates to negative, hello, you're going to wipe out the pension funds, which is what's happened. They're all kind of, they're basically insolvent at this stage. So we have a, a major financial crisis. And... Um, I mean, I, I know Schwab, and the two of us have been sitting on opposite tables, and actually the guy that made the movie on me also made the movie on him. Uh, so, um, you know, we've... Can you clarify for our listeners now, we're talking about Klaus Schwab, and they may not be familiar, nearly as familiar with him as they are with Martin Armstrong. Klaus Schwab runs the World Economic Forum, and uh, it's... He's been pushing this great reset. I mean, he's created all kinds of things, the young leaders, uh, young global leaders. He's been training people in his economic theory, and that is basically communism uh, with a, a twist, perhaps. But uh, he is you know, a typical academic, and the academics and economics are always extremely left. And and this is the problem. And this is he's had. Uh, we started our World <clears throat> Economic Conferences in 1985, and then he copied us and started the World Economic Forum, which is, people may know it more as Davos, uh, in 1987. Uh, and <clears throat> even Nigel Farage came and spoke at our conference in in Rome in 2019. And he stood up and he says, of course he's here. We are the alternative to Davos. So I've always been on the opposite side of, of Schwab. I mean, we've shaken hands, fine. Um, but, I mean, I understand what's going on. And he's been pitching to governments that the way out of this crisis, because the ECB cannot raise rates without blowing up its economy, the European bond market is basically destroyed. Uh, I was in New York a few months ago, and the top banks will not even accept European government debt as collateral anymore. Uh, the repo crisis they may have heard about, uh, which started in August 2019, was that U.S. banks were not willing to lend overnight to European banks. So then the Federal Reserve had to step in to shore up that market. Well, now they will not even take government debt from Europe. So this whole thing is, is really, really collapsing. Uh, and that's why, you, you know, honestly, I think, you know, the whole Ukrainian thing is basically part and parcel of this. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of Ukrainian friends, and they are, like, beside themselves as to what Zelensky is even doing. I mean... The two provinces are 98 to 99% Russian to begin with, all right? And they were just Russians that were there during the Soviet Union. And um, since 2014, the, that revolution overthrew uh, Yanukovych, uh, they've been in negotiations and they wanted to separate as well and just be their own independence. So what's happened here is that, um, you know, that's what, you know, after eight years, and it's been a civil war there, uh, so it, it, it doesn't make any sense to a lot of Ukrainians that uh, why is he putting the whole country at risk for these two provinces that wanted independence since 2014? Um, Putin came out and just said, you know, he's willing to uh, shut down the war, let the two provinces go and relinquish any of your claims to Crimea, which is also, you know, 99% Russians there. Um, so 
you know, many of the Ukrainians feel that Zelensky's been pushing this when he ran for election, promising exactly the opposite. Uh, and so they think that he's more of a puppet from the West uh, trying to push this thing. And why it, it seems to make some sense is that Europe is now saying, see, we need a European army. It's to federalize Europe finally and take it to the next route. The bond market's pretty much destroyed of all, all of these independent uh, republics. And so now they're pushing for a euro bond. So it, it's basically they're using this Ukrainian thing as the excuse to finally accomplish the final step of federalizing Europe. Uh, and Americans don't realize that, I mean, most of what we hear is propaganda, like, oh, you, you know, uh, Ukraine's fighting for democracy. And... That is such nonsense. It's, it's crazy. I mean, Europe has killed democracy. Uh, and Schwab had his hand in, in how the EU was, was designed. The head of the EU does not run for election. They're appointed. The European Commission, which makes all the laws, never stands for election. They're appointed. All right. The only people that stand for election are Parliament, and they have no power to override the, uh, the you know, the commission or the, or the head of the EU. It's just a dog and pony show. That's the end of democracy. And that's what they would love to bring over here. Uh, and, and what sort of started that was when Trump was elected uh, back in 2016, because they suddenly European uh, leaders got scared. And they thought, oh, gee, maybe we could be overthrown as well. Uh, that Trump was not a, uh, a a career politician, and they were calling it uh, not democracy that the people voted for Trump. They were calling it, you know, populism. And now populism was evil because they can can put somebody in and they don't really know what they're doing and overthrow the system. And that's what um, I mean. Even the London Financial Times did a, a piece on it. You can find it on our site, but. Um, about how upset they were that that Trump was even elected, and that's why you know you saw the Republicans were even stabbing him in the back, uh, McCain and and Lindsey Graham, etc. Um, you know they don't like somebody from outside of Washington. So like Biden is Senate, all right? Uh, Harris, the same thing. Uh, I was down there in Washington when Ronald Reagan was elected. And they were beside themselves then because he was a governor, you know, and all I heard was, oh, we're going to have to train him. They don't like anybody who's not from Washington that, you know, and Trump's, I think, was naive in that sense that when he's standing up saying he's going to, you know, um, drain the swamp. Well, the swamp is both sides. So uh, he had both sides actually against them down there. So and and then they are the ones that pick the people for the cabinet. And every one of them was stabbing him in the back from the CIA, NSA, uh, Bolton, uh, you name it. I mean, it, he thought it was being president of the United States was more like running a, uh, a corporation. And it's just not. Those people are not loyal to you. They're career politicians. They're there, and they know they're going to be there when you're leave. So why should I really, you know, care about you? Um, the same thing with, you know, the rumors that, oh, just because, like, uh, uh, Bush Jr. or Sr. Was, was worked for the CIA, he's, you know, that doesn't mean anything. The, the head of the CIA is big. oh, gee, would you like a golf? I'll, I'll set you up for a golf meeting today. They know they're political. They know they'll be gone in two years. They don't walk in there and say, gee, you know, uh, we assassinate this one, this one. Uh, you know, they don't reveal all the secrets to the head of the CIA. No way. They're just, you know, they're just political appointments. And they know that. So this is what we're facing. And, you know, I've said, I think on your show before, that gold does not go up with inflation. Gold goes up when you have the collapse in the confidence of government. 
And if you look closely at the whole 1980 rally, which was misrepresented as, as inflation, uh, gold only went from 200 to 400 from 1976 to uh, December 79. It went from 400 to 875 in the last few weeks when Russia invaded Afghanistan. All right? Look at gold right now. You see gold running up, getting through the, the 2000 mark. Well, <clears throat> Bitcoin's been going down since November. You had all these people out there saying, oh, Bitcoin's replaced gold. This is it. You know, and okay, fine. And what did I say? I said, gold will go up with the dollar. And that's what you see. Why? Because it reflects capital fleeing Europe. Some people are buying equity. Some people are buying, you know, the dollar. Some people buy gold. Not everybody's the same. But you end up with gold going up and the dollar going up because of capital flight. The whole roaring 20s. That was created because of World War I. All the capital came here to America. When you got tanks running down the street blowing up the banks, you're going to leave your money there? They were all sent it over here. And the United States was virtually bankrupt in 1896. That's when J.P. Morgan had to arrange a $100 million gold loan to bail out the Treasury. All right, so we went from bankrupt in 1896 to the... Uh, <clears throat> financial capital of the world after World War One, all right? And then after World War Two, we ended up with 76% of the entire world gold reserves because all the capital came here, all right? That's why Brenton Woods was setting up basically and, uh, you know, fixing gold to $35 and the dollar became the reserve currency because it was all here. And you're seeing the same thing happen again. Uh, it doesn't mean that dollar will survive long term. But uh, what this basically means is that you're, you always see capital fleas wherever you are, uh, wherever the risk of war is. So like when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, capital fled the United States, went to Europe. But when it's in Europe, it flees Europe and comes over here. It's just simply the way it, it it has historically moved. So um, you see gold rising and Bitcoin declining. You see the dollar up. And this is all, you know, very important, but based upon capital flows. That's what our computer does. It's tracking everything in the world. Um, it's the only fully functioning artificial intelligence system in the world. Um IBM created Big Blue and they thought it was going to cure uh, cancer. It failed. Um, basically, the way I designed their system was completely different than than IBM. Uh, but <clears throat> it, the computer physically writes over a thousand reports on markets around the world. We we cover everything from their services in China. We're not. Because, you know, the government knows the computer's writing everything. And so you don't have to worry about, you know, paragraph three, by the way, overthrow your government or something. Um, when <clears throat> China was basically uh, the Asian currency crisis, I'm the one that they called in. I went, met with the central bank. Uh, I helped China become capitalist. Uh, explaining how the system works. They were quite different from the Russians. Um, with China, I was taken to this facility, and they were downloading the Internet. Uh, there was probably at least 300 people, and they were all surfing the Internet and downloading everything. Um, I was taken to a room. They were basically monitoring absolutely everything, in, in China, but they were not interfering like the Russians would do. Um, and simple questions that you, that we would think, but to them, like they were tracking 249 varieties of tea. So what there was was that they couldn't understand why this tea 
selling for like like a dollar in one place and it would be five dollars someplace else. And I said, well, where is this tea coming from? And they said, here. I said, well, the first thing you have is transportation costs. And they go, oh, really? Yeah. I said, yes. I said, then people will naturally pay for something they think is better and it comes from someplace else. This is why communism failed. If it was a dollar here, it had to be a dollar over there, even if it cost you $10 to get it there. Uh, so it was totally impractical. And all this nonsense of, oh, equality and all that, that's very nice. Um, you know, I don't think somebody's going to want to pay, pay me $50 million to go, you know, pitch basketballs in, in a game. Everybody has different talents. Um, some talents are very rare. Some talents are not. Um, so equality and you know in rights, yes, but th- this nonsense that we all have to be equal monetarily is is completely bogus. It has never worked, um, and most of them came from you know I, I would say that probably the first communist state was Sparta against Athens. Um, in the 5th century, you know, B.C., and, and they didn't even issue coins. All the other states issued coins. No, nobody should have money like that, and, and Sparta failed. Uh, you know, it, it's just the way it is. I mean, you're, you're going against human nature. So at this stage in the game, uh, you have to understand that what uh, makes really gold rise is the collapse in confidence in government. And that's where we're heading into. And then and the, the next 10 years is the worst of it, honestly. Um, it, it's, it's all based upon capital flows, and humans react the same way to the similar events. Um, I mean, our computer projected in 1985... The 2016 would be the the first time that a non-politician would would win, and that became Trump. He just happened to be there at the right time. All right, um, we were, our computer was the only one to forecast that that Brexit would win. So uh, Nigel Farage came in and was our keynote speaker in Rome. He says, "Of course, I had to come." He's the only one that said that we would win. Um, you know, you know, people want to take polls and twist them and try and influence people, whatever. Um, our computer is not motivated by human um, desires or dreams or whatever. It just comes out with what it's coming out with. And uh, my job is just to say, hey, look, this is here are the arrays. You can look at them yourself and you can look at them on any um, economy or market around the world. I mean, it's uh, not my personal opinion. So it's taught me an awful lot about how things work. But uh, right now, you have Biden coming out with an executive order. And what have I been warning about? That cryptocurrencies are not going to replace the dollar. And these people are only allowing it to flourish to get people um, acclimated to digital currencies. And his executive order that he's about to sign basically is to encourage the central bank to issue a a digital currency. He is putting restraints on uh, cryptocurrency because, oh, gee, Russia could be circumventing the sanctions and using cryptocurrency. So we have to control that now, too. Every excuse they have. And then eventually what you will see is they will seize all the cryptocurrencies convert them into the Fed's cryptocurrency, and you'll get whatever it is that they say. Uh, That's the way it is. They do not allow competition to who controls the currency. I mean, that's been the divine right of kings for forever. Uh, Anybody else, they call it a a, a counterfeit. So uh, you have him doing that. You have him coming out saying, putting sanctions on energy from Russia, all of this is part of this great reset agenda. Uh, <clears throat> eliminate fossil fuels. They even put a clock up in, in New York saying we only had seven years left 
um, so they are moving based upon what what they say. You got to just take them as they you know at their word. It's not conspiracy theory. I mean, Schwab has put out his. You will see the World Economic uh, Forum Agenda 2030 with eight points. Uh, his first one basically saying, you'll own nothing and be happy, is his communistic idea. But it, there's more to it than that. Uh, the government debts um, are unsustainable. So the problem here is ha- normally, you know, government always defaults. And so how do they default in this environment, which has been all socialistic? All the pension funds have been regulated. They have to have government bonds. So if they default, they wipe out all the pensions of everybody. So by saying you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, they make it sound like they're doing it for you. We're going to leave you of all your debt. So you won't own student debt, credit card debt, mortgages. All right. And be like, you know, the old Soviet Union. They owned all the property. But um, in doing it that way, they make it sound they're doing it for you, when in fact it's them who's defaulting. But they can't default, otherwise there's going to be millions of people with pitchforks running down there as putting their heads on spikes. So, like the good old days, you know. So um, it's a more clever plot that they're up to. And... <clears throat> Uh, look, they needed this whole Russia uh, nonsense uh, to further this agenda, to justify what they need to do. Uh, and I spoke to someone in Germany. I mean, it, they're busting windows of, of stores that are owned by Russians. They're basically a crystal knock against Russians. Um, you had a New York Met um uh, fired the head soprano simply because she was Russian. Um, so now Russians have become the new, you know, uh, people to hate, and, and that's basically what's taking place. I mean, um, you have ICE sending out notices. They will no longer accept any money from, from any Russian sanctioned banks, so they're cutting them off from data. Um it's 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 systemic everywhere you go. You got the governor of New Jersey uh, coming out up there. They have Luke Oil gas stations and proposing to uh, you know shut them all down because they simply have a Russian owner. Uh, they're seizing yachts. Of um, this is really highly dangerous. It's one thing to put sanctions from one country on another. When you start seizing all the property of people simply because they're Russian. Then, I mean, I've been, you know, an international, with well, probably one of the earliest international hedge fund managers and an analyst. And I've got clients everywhere. We even have offices in China, every, you know, Middle East, you, you name it, we're there, basically. Uh, and what the solution here is, is really serious because the number one risk in advising on international <clears throat> funds management is country risk. So I would never advise a client to put money in Iran because they nationalized all the oil. Why would you put investment there and the government doesn't respect it and can and come, come up with some excuse and just seize it all? So country risk is your first decision. And now you have Europe and the United States just seizing people because they're Russian. That's very dangerous. Because honestly, from a, 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 an advisory standpoint, do I have a clear conscience in telling Chinese that no problem investing in the United States or Europe if we get in a dispute with, with China, they start seizing private assets there too? This is not good. And the other thing people should understand is we're tearing the world economy apart. When Russia went into Crimea, um, Obama stood up and he was threatening to take them out of SWIFT. 
the SWIFT organization stood up and said, no, you're not going to use SWIFT for political purposes. This is how the world economy functions. Now, this time, you got a new head of SWIFT in there since 2019, and he goes, oh, okay, fine. You want us to take Russia out? All right, we'll unplug them. So now, now what's going on? China's going full steam ahead, pushing for their alternative uh, to SWIFT. What does that mean? It means that you're taking the world economy and re-erecting a financial iron curtain. So there will be no more international capital movement. All of this is coming to an end because of the overzealous sanctions on Russia. If it's Russia, it should be the Russian government. It should not be all Russian citizens. And you have even you know Biden proposing to shut off all the Russian credit cards, MasterCard, and because the people have to rise up against Putin. They're not going to do it that way. They're going to see the West as evil. So, I mean, you can't attack people like that. Uh, that's what brought Hitler to power. The reparation payments and, and the little guy in, in, in Germany was being crushed for the political decisions of their leadership before. And that's why, you know, Hitler came to power. He said, enough of this. And they said, yes, you're right. We've had enough. You can't punish the people. Uh, even Keynes came out and warned them, do not do this. So this is where we're at. Uh, it's an interesting scenario, but just you, you have to understand uh, the real fundamentals taking place here. And once you do, then you look at the markets in a, in a fresh new light.